Well, as always, church, it's good to be with you. Um, if you're new or visiting, my name is Tyler. I'm the campus pastor here, one of our preaching pastors and elders of the Bible. Go and open up to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. The book of Exodus, chapter 3. Um, if you're new or visiting, we're continuing our series through the book of Exodus. That's what we do at the Austin Stone. We go through books of the Bible, verse by verse. And so we're in the book of Exodus. We're going to be there. It's long, maybe forever. I don't know. We'll see. But we're in the book of Exodus, and we're going to be there for quite a while. And today, today we find ourselves in a very pivotal moment, both in Exodus, but in the entire scope of the Bible. Like The text today is one of those texts that's especially important. It's especially important because the text today is going to be when God comes to Moses finally and he reveals who he is to Moses. The text today, we're going to see that God's going to show what he's like to Moses and tell Moses what his name is. And so every book in the Bible, every word in the Bible is communicating to us. God is speaking to us something about himself. But there are particular texts where it's abundantly clear. Right, throughout the scriptures, there's nuance, there's subtlety throughout the scriptures where God speaks. But in certain texts like today, God is abundantly clear and he's explicit to you, to me, about what he is like and who he is. And so it's important for us because every single one of you in this room, we all have thoughts about God. Every single one of you has thoughts about God. Even those people, maybe you're here and we're glad that you're here, who would consider themselves atheist or agnostic or even apathetic about God, still have thoughts about God. Even those designations, you are saying something about God, about what he's like or what he's not like. And so when you have a, a text like this that tells you, hey, God is saying, this is who I am, you and I have to think critically and introspectively and say, does God's description of himself line up with my description of him? Is what God communicates about himself, does it line up with what I think and feel and have experienced with him? Because even though our culture and our society may be more than ever probably not associating itself with religions, conversations about God still happen all the time. Even though people may not like religion necessarily or instit institutional churches or these types of things, people still want to talk about God. You see it all the time. And so if I were to ask an average person in this church or in this city, what is God like? What do you think they would say? If I just said, blanket, what is God like? They would have a lot of different responses. If I narrowed it, so that's kind of vague, it's kind of general, but what if I narrowed it? What if I said, no, 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 what is most essential about God? Like, what's that thing about God that if you miss this one thing about God, you'll never understand what he is like? I think that would probably narrow the responses a little bit. I think probably in our context, in our day and age, the dominant attribute that someone would use to describe God would be love. But what we're going to see in this text is that there is an attribute of God, about God in this text so clear, so essential, and it's an attribute that I don't think many of us would use to describe God. It's an attribute that if I ask even people in this church, give me the most essential thing about God, I don't know that many of us, many of us would use this attribute to describe him. And the attribute that we're going to learn about today is the fact that God is holy. The fact that God is holy. And this attribute, this reality of God, is something that has been probably forgotten, maybe even unspoken, and I would dare to say unwanted in our day and age. I think deep down we don't even know that we want God to be holy because of all of the preconceived notions about what we think that means. But this is highly problematic for us. See, you may even agree. You may even agree that God is holy. You may say, yeah, I totally agree with that. But the fact that we don't ever talk about it, the fact that it never comes up, shows how little we value and how little we understand who God is. And this is a big deal. Because if you lose the holiness of God, here's what begins to happen. You begin to lose God himself. If you don't understand the holiness of God and you don't have a proper value of his holiness, you will eventually lose God himself. It eventually will happen because the truth that God is holy is at the core of who he is. The truth that he's holy is at the core of who he is. It shapes and defines everything else about him. 
It's so essential to him that if you don't understand his holiness, you will be, un be unable to understand anything else about him. See, if you don't understand his holiness, you'll never understand his love. If you don't understand his holy, holiness, you'll never understand his love. Why? Because his love is holy and it's like no other. You won't understand his love because it's a holy type of love. It's distinct from your love. And so you'll begin to put love in your categories, but it's not like those loves. It's holy. It's different. It's distinct. You won't understand his power. It's a holy power. You won't understand his wisdom or his knowledge or his grace or his mercy. Why? Because they are holy. You won't understand the cross of Jesus Christ if you don't understand the holiness of God. And so when we think about holiness, it's one of those terms that can be vague and amorphous. You don't really know how to define it. Let me give you a very succinct, clear definition of the holiness of God. Here's what it is. There is nothing and no one like God. If you were to sum up, what does it mean for God to be holy? It means there is nothing and no one like God. He is utterly unique. There's no one who's even close to him. There's no one who's even a close second. He's utterly alone in his worth and his value. There's no one even to compare him to. His holiness is why he is so valuable. The reason God is so valuable is because he is so holy. The more rare something is, the more valuable it is, right? The more rare something is, the more valuable it is. Well, there is nothing more rare than God, therefore there is nothing more valuable than him. I'll read you this quote about the holiness of God by John Piper. It's gonna be on the screen behind me. He says, but only God is God, and therefore he is holy, utterly different, distinct, unique. All else is creation, he alone creates. All else begins, he alone was. All else depends, he alone is self-sufficient. And therefore the holiness of God is synonymous with his infinite value. Diamonds are valuable because they are rare and hard to make. God is infinitely valuable because he is the rarest of all beings and cannot be made at all, nor was he ever made. If I were a collector of rare treasures and could somehow have God, the Holy One, in my treasury, I would be wealthier than all the collectors of all the rarest treasures that exist outside God. He's holy. So when God gives you his love, what is he giving you? He's giving you a love like no other without equal. When God gives you his truth, he's giving you truth that stands above all other truths. His holiness defines everything else about him. And that is the best news for us. That's the best news for you and for me because that means our joy will be eternal because we have a treasure like no other. Nothing compares to him and he doesn't run out of being distinct and different and holy and worthy. This is why Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a man, he's walking along and he finds a treasure in a field. And the man sees how valuable the treasure is so that man goes and sells all that he has, why? To buy the field and to have the treasure. God is saying, Jesus is saying that to have the kingdom of God is better than having every treasure in the universe. And the reason is because God is holy. There's nothing and no one like him. So God's going to show Moses today and you and me and everyone else. He's going to say, if you want to know me, if you want to know what I'm like, first and foremost, you have to know that I am holy. There is nothing and no one like me. Let's look at Exodus 3, 1 through 7. You're going to see this for yourself in the scriptures. Exodus 3, 1 through 7. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your, off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So when we last saw Moses last week, he was 40 years old going into the wilderness. And now, at this point, he's 80. He's 80 years old, and he is doing what he always does. He's taking care of the flock. He's walking along like he does every other day. What's important about this in verse 1, it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, something he did all the time. So this day for Moses is an ordinary day. Like every other day, like you, he's getting up, going to work, doing what he normally does, and he's not looking for God today. He's not waking up thinking, I can't wait to see a bush on fire. That's not what he's thinking. He's walking along, doing what he always does. And that's when God shows up. Because Moses notices there's a bush on fire, which is nothing out of the ordinary. If he was bored, like, I like watching things burn up. I mean, he may be bored and not knowing what to do, but he looks at it and then he goes, that bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. So he has to go check it out. Look at verse 2 and 3 again. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight why the bush is not burned. So Moses is walking along on his path, and here's what's fascinating. He turns aside to go see what's up. It's a great picture of what God does to us. You're on your normal trajectory, your normal path, not looking for him, and then God shows up and he takes you on a, a different trajectory. God shows up and says, I'm going to bring a detour into your life. It looks really random to you, but it's really purposeful to me. And in the fire, God begins to speak to Moses. Now, here's the question. Why the burning bush? Right? Like, he's an infinite, eternal God, and the best thing he come up with was a bush on fire? You're like, man, you ever had an iPhone or something? You can invent that and show him? Like, wow, that's cool. Like, what, why this? Of all the different possibilities that God, who is infinite and eternal, could come up with, why a bush that's on fire that's not being consumed? Because this is Moses' first interaction with God. This is the first time he's ever encountered God. So why this? Because God wants to show Moses how holy he is. The reason for the burning bush, God wants to show Moses a picture, a symbol of his holiness. See, a bush that's on fire, that's not being burned up or consumed, is inexplicable in our world. Right? It's inexplicable. It makes no sense. We have no category for fire that doesn't burn bushes. We have no category for a bush that when it's on fire doesn't burn up. We can't explain it. I mean, how would you explain that? Well, this is where people may look at this text if you're skeptical and say, there's no way this could be true. This is why the Bible is not real because, I mean, look, this is impossible. And that's a way to explain it. Or it could be that God's there. Or it could be, no, the reason this is happening, because God is here, and here's what God is communicating to Moses and to you and to me. You don't have a category for a bush that's on fire that doesn't burn up. God's saying, that's what I'm like. You don't have a category for me. I, I, don't, ex I don't fit your pre-existing categories as to what I'm like and what reality is like. No, he's showing Moses, I am a being who exists outside of your reality. You couldn't understand me if I tried to explain myself to you in all the ways that I could, so I'll give you a really simple picture to show you I'm inexplicable in your categories. He's saying, I'm holy, I'm different, I'm like no one else that you know. So he used the burning bush, but then later on in this text, he shows Moses his name. He tells Moses his name and shows him how holy he is. See, right after this text, God tells Moses, hey, I'm going to save Israel in all these ways. And then Moses asked him his name. Look at verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So Moses is talking to God. He's there in front of the burning bush, out of the fire, God's speaking to him. And he tells him, he goes, okay, I see the promise, you're going to save us. But you're going to use me? You're going to use me to go do that? God, I tried 40 years ago, they rejected me. So if I show up again, they're going to have some questions. Moses, we thought you were dead, you were long gone. Who sent you to come save us then? And he asked God, God, what do I tell them? 
And God says, I am who I am. I am who I am. This statement is so rich with meaning and insight into who God is. We can't exhaust it here today, but let me give you a couple of things. Here's what God is telling Moses. He's telling him, I'm like nothing you know. I'm like nothing that you know. I have no beginning. I have no end. I don't change. I depend on nothing. He's telling him, my being and my character are what they are simply because I am. Confused? My being and my character are what they are simply because I am. There, God is telling him, there is no reference point for me. There's no reference point. You can't say, I'm kind of like this. Doesn't work. I'm like nothing that you know. So tell them, I am has sent you to them. And it's important to know that what God says here, God says, I am who I am. He does not say, I am who you want me to be. He does not say, I am who you expect me to be. God does not diminish his holiness so that Moses or you would feel a little bit more comfortable. He doesn't diminish his holiness that we may have an, have an easier time accepting him or explaining him. He doesn't reveal himself to you and to me and to Moses in order to be shaped by us and what we think he should be like. That's not what he does. That's why God showed up in a fire. He revealed himself through a fire. Why? Because you can't shape a fire. If he was clay, you could shape him. If he was water, you could use your hands and, and manipulate him and help him be a certain form that you want. But with fire, you play with fire with your hands, it destroys you. And God is saying, you cannot shape me into something that you like. I am who I am. This is why you and I have to be so faithful to fight, against, to fight against the urges in us that want God to be different than he is. We have to fight to believe whatever he has said about himself in his word, that's who he is. Because if God doesn't tell us about God, we'll never know him. If God does not tell us about himself, we will never know him. Because why? We don't have any category for him. He exists outside of our reality, so every attempt to describe him or explain him would be futile because we, we know no, no one and nothing like him. He's outside of our framework. Years ago, years ago, I had a friend of mine, uh, he was talking to a coworker of his about the birth of Jesus. And the time, my buddy was working at Cheddar's, and so it was at the end of a long day, a long shift, he's with this buddy of his who didn't know Jesus, didn't believe in Christ. So they're talking, long day, kind of just relaxing, and you're talking about Christmas, because around Christmas time and about the birth of Jesus. And the guy looks at my friend and goes, okay, you're telling me that an infinite, eternal God became a little baby. That's what you're saying. That an infinite being became a little baby. You believe that, for real? The guy goes, yeah, that's exactly what I believe. He's like, that's what you're telling me. He's like, that's what I'm telling you. And the guy just like slumped back in his chair. His mind was like blown and all he could do was utter a four-letter expletive that I can't say. He's like, like, I don't understand. Have you ever thought that? You're like, God has no beginning. What does that mean? He didn't have a beginning, so he's always this. And your brain starts hurting? We don't have a framework for this God. We have no categories for him, but in the scriptures. Just so you know this, in the scriptures, he gives us a picture of himself in a way we can understand. This is why the Bible is so important because he comes to us in words we can understand to tell us what he is like. That is why whatever he says about himself, even if everyone else doesn't like it, even if even deep down you don't like it, our responsibility is to receive his testimony and say, God, only you know what you're like. You exist outside my categories and my reality. That's why you need to be wary and uneasy when someone presents to you some sort of new knowledge about God, some sort of new spirituality or way of following him, because most so-called new ways of knowing God and new perspectives on him are nothing more than man making God into his image. Nothing more than us saying, we sure would like God to be this way, let's make him that way. But there's no one and nothing like him, so when he speaks, you and I, do you know what we do? receive. 
And we shape our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our families, our churches around him. He's not bending to you and to me and what we'd like him to be like. No, we bend to him. He has a special category in our lives. And so this is what happens. Moses says, sees this holy God, and then God tells him, I'm so holy, I'm like, nothing you know. And when you approach me, when you encounter me, you can't approach me the way you would anyone else. You can't just come strolling up to me in a cavalier manner as if I'm like anything else in the universe. No, God tells Moses, if you're going to approach me, you have to do it on my terms. Look at verse four. Verse four. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. So God calls out, Moses, Moses, and he starts walking towards me. He goes, stop where you are. Take your sandals off your feet because you're not just standing on some random patch of dirt in the Middle East. You're standing on holy ground because the presence of God is here. The presence of God is here. And he's telling Moses, you can't just approach me the way you would anyone else. You can't just walk up and stroll and think it's no big deal. No, he says, you need to be aware that you are in the presence of the most valuable most powerful being imaginable. You're here with me right now. And God says, you meet me on my terms. He does not say, Moses, what do you feel like doing? How would you like to honor me today? He says, this is what you do. Take the sandals off your feet as a sign of respect that you know you are not talking to any normal being. You're talking to God himself talking to God himself. See, God wanting to know Moses and God speaking to Moses does not lessen his holiness. It doesn't somehow mean that he's cool with you talking to him however you'd like. No, it means that that's part of his holiness. See, God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. And yet he wants to know us. And yet, this God who needs no one, needs nothing, is like no one, and like nothing, calls out to you and calls out to me. Moses, Moses, come here. Stop where you are. You can't get any closer. I'm God, but I still want to know you. But then the question becomes, how can a people like you and a people like me know a God like him? Like, how is it possible? Because God made you and me in his image. He made Moses in his image. And yet what do we do? We reject his authority and we trample over his holiness. Humanity's default is to treat God as less than holy. You've heard the term sin before. You've heard the term sin before, and one of the aspects of sin, one of the root causes of sin is we don't view God as holy. We view him as common. We view him like everything else in our lives. He's one of many things to consider. When you read the Old Testament, it's sad to see what we're like. God would show up in power for Israel and do incredible acts of power He'd save them from Egypt. He'd heal them of sickness. He'd rescue them again and again and again, and yet their default response over time was to treat him as common. That eventually the default response was, oh yeah, God, yeah, he's, he's, he's a good guy. I need to honor him, but I have other things that I'd like to do. Like over time, he became one of many important things in their lives. Over time, his word became one of many perspectives they should weigh and consider as they live their lives. This is our story. How often do you and I read the Bible, we read it, and we read it the same way we read the newspaper? You read it, you go, interesting, that's cool. Jesus is this way. He said to renounce all that you have if you're going to follow me. Great. And we treat it the same way as we read a headline or the scores of the game last night. It's just information Great, I know this new thing, but it's not going to shape how I live. It's going to be new knowledge I can use at a Bible study to sound really smart and put people in their place. But I'm not going to obey it. I mean, how often you and I have had thoughts or even have said, I will not do this thing no matter what God says. How many times have we thought that? I will not, God. 
I will not. If you say this, I will not believe. How often we'll do religious acts of obedience and we'll have these gestures that we really think God is holy, but really we're most concerned with our reputation, not his. The reason we're doing the religious things is to show other people how strong and disciplined we are, not has nothing to do with God being holy. And so when you look at what we're like, our tendency is to always treat him as common, as if his words were like every other word, as if he was like any other person that you know, just someone and something to consider for your life. And so it seems like in the Bible you have these two options. You have one option where we could know God, but he's going to be okay with us treating him as less than holy, treating him as common, or we could not know God, and God would pour out his wrath on us for our lack of reverence to him. Like those are the two options, because you and I can't change. Our tendency, even on our best days, even when you feel really good, is to treat God as common. But God, like only he can, finds a way to save us in a way that is holy in a way that is like nothing else that you and I have ever heard or known. Jesus comes and brings a salvation that we've never, we could never imagine. See, there's this great scene in the Chronicles of Narnia. There's this great scene in the Chronicles of Narnia where C.S. Lewis, he captures, I mean, perfectly what it's like to interact with God. He captures perfectly what it's like to encounter a holy God. He captures perfectly what it feels like because around God, here's what happens. You can feel simultaneously comforted and terrified. You can feel simultaneously encouraged and rebuked, strong and weak, confident and insecure. He has this strange way about him that when you get around him, he makes you feel like nobody else. So I'm going to read you this pretty long scene, but I love it because it shows us and captures this really, really well. The scene is this. There's a girl named Jill, and she's dying of thirst. This young girl named Jill, she's in this new world she's never been in before. She's dying of thirst, and she finally finds a stream, but there's a giant lion sitting at the stream named Aslan staring at her. Here's what it says. Are you not thirsty, said the lion? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at his motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to, not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had t- come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one who had seen his stern face could do that and her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she ever had to do, but she went forward to the stream, knelt down, and began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. Before she tasted it, she had been intending to make a dash away from the lion the moment she had finished. Now... Now she realized that this would be, on the whole, the most dangerous thing of all. I love that scene. Because you and I are a lot like Jill. Thirsty, you have all these desires in you God made to be met in him. We go to all these different things, and the only water you can find is stale and stagnant and old. And so the one place where the streams are fresh, the one place where you can be satisfied is where God is. And so like Jill, we see God. And we know deep down that if we get too close, he'll eat us up. 
If we get too close, he's going to consume us. We get around God. This is why even coming to church sometimes, you can feel guilty and feel ashamed. Why? Because being around God reminds you of how far from him you really are. It reminds you how often you reject him. And so we want to be around God, but know that he's safe. We want to be around God and want him to promise that you're not going to gobble us up. I love that line. She says, well, promise you won't eat me. I make no promise. Well, have you eaten girls before? I've devoured everyone before. Welp, like what do you say? What do you do? And like Aslan, God is not making every promise you want. God, if I come, you promise me that my family will be this way. God, if I come, you promise that my bank account, you promise that this person, you promise this sickness will leave. God says, I make no promise. Here's the promise I do make. Every thirst will be satisfied. Everything that you're dying to get will be satisfied. See, he's not a tame lion, but he's good. And he's trustworthy, even when he's terrifying. Even when what he says doesn't comfort us the way he, we thought he would. But it comforts us, comforts us in the very best way because Jill, what happens? She gets the water, she scoops it up, and she realizes this is the most refreshing water I ever had. And she begins to understand that though it was terrifying to be vulnerable before the lion and put her neck out and be honest and drink from the stream, she knew the most dangerous thing would have been to leave him altogether and die of thirst on her own. That's what she found out. And that's what it feels like to know God. That's what it feels like to know God. See, you're, you're gonna get around him, whether you know him for the first time or the rest of your life as you know him, you're gonna get around God and his holiness is such, his purity is such, his perfection is such that when you get around him, all you see are more flaws in you. The more you follow Jesus, I'm telling you, the more sins in yourself that you see. Because you get around his holiness and you begin to realize, man, I am more wicked, more, for, more perverse, more insecure. I'm more self-righteous than I ever knew. And you're going to find yourself saying, I'll never commit that sin and then committing it. You're going to find yourself saying, I'll never go down that path there on, then you find yourself on it. Emotions you never thought you'd feel towards people you can't get rid of. And so what happens, you get around God and you think, I can't even go to him. I can't sing a song. I can't offer a prayer. My week has been terrible. My life has been terrible. And we get around him and we feel insecure and anxious and we're saying, God, 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 promise me it'll be okay. He says, I promise to quench every thirst. And right when you think he's going to devour you and consume you, what does he give to us? Refreshing streams of love and forgiveness and grace. That's what God's like. And that's only possible, it's only possible to approach the great lion and not be consumed because of Jesus. He's the only way you can be around him with no fear of being cast out. See, God sent Jesus to live and die and resurrect for us and you know what Jesus does? He shows you and shows me that to be in God's presence and not be consumed by him requires much more than taking off sandals and gestures of honor. It requires much more than religious acts of obedience and outward forms of godliness. It requires much more than you just being a nice person and giving a little bit of money and attending church. It requires much more than promising, God, I'll never commit that sin again. It requires much more than that. He's too holy for you to buy his love. He can't be bought by you and by me. We can't do enough to be in his presence and not be consumed. No, it requires that Jesus die for us. That's what it requires. How do you approach a holy God like him? Jesus. Because to treat God as, it, as anything less than the most valuable most worthy being in the universe requires e either Jesus be consumed or you. It requires that when you get around him, the only way you cannot be burned up by his holiness is through the love of Jesus Christ. 
See, we have this faulty way of thinking that in the Old Testament, God really cared about his holiness, but in the New Testament, not so much. Jesus shows us nothing could be further from the truth. No, Jesus doesn't diminish the holiness of God. He elevates it. He elevates the holiness of God. He shows us, no, no, you thought you could just do things for him to love you? You can't do it. You need me and me alone. See, now in Christ, we're almost done. In Christ, the burning bush that we saw in Exodus 3 now is a picture of us. The the burning bush is now a picture of every believer because Jesus has made what should be consumed by the presence of God able to stand. We become a picture of this burning bush that we, in and of ourselves around God, his holy presence would consume us, but now because of Jesus, we're in his presence, unscathed and loved by him. God told Moses, if you're gonna come to me, you need to take off your sandals and meet me on my terms, but now the terms have changed for the world. The terms today and the terms forever, the holy God, like no other, says, if you are going to approach me, If you're gonna have these streams of living water, there's one condition. And it's not take your sandals off, it's receive Christ. There's one condition, there's one way, whether it's your first time or your millionth time approaching God, it's always receive Christ. It's always honor him, love him, listen to him, revere him like you would nobody else. The terms are clear, look, to Jesus, the great lion sitting by the streams who says, come and drink, who makes no promise other than to quench every thirst you've ever had in ways you've never known. Let's pray together. Father, we can't even begin to understand how holy you are, how great you are, how massive you are, how spectacular you are. And so, God, even in this time, our tendency is to not know how to respond. Our tendency is to still put you in categories we're familiar with, but, God, would you give us eyes to see that you're greater than we could imagine, that you're more pure than we could imagine, that your words are like no other word, your character like no other character, and the happiness you bring to those who find you like no other. God, I want to understand and value your holiness more than I do. God, I want us as a people to treat you with reverence and awe like nobody else. God, I want your word when we hear it and when we read it We'd receive it like the word from the living God, not just some random person. That it's truth and there's life where you are. And that God, you would receive the worship that is only due your name. That our lives and our songs that we sing would reflect there is no one like our God. And that we'd be reminded the joyful spot of being small in front of a great God being small but loved by this great God. Oh God, would you do a work in us as a people where the city would see how holy you are and be in awe that you would send your son after us. God, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, church, let's stand together.